I'm Dr. John Cruz, and I'm this week going to be talking about neurofeedback for ADHD. Despite there being neurofeedback protocols and clinics in operation for a number of decades, specifically targeting ADHD, the amount of published data showing any clear efficacy and particularly benefits exceeding that of a placebo or sham group is amazingly small or weak and led one recent editorial column in the American Journal of Psychiatry to say, maybe it's time we even stop doing research. I'm to call it quits on neurofeedback for ADHD. I'm not sure. I'm ready to say it's that bleak, but I'll jump into the data in the next 20 minutes with you. So to start with, what is neurofeedback? I mean, the word just means we're getting feedback from our neurons, from our brain. So it's a process of measuring activity in an individual's brain, looking at specific either regions or frequencies. Hopefully that these parameters are tied to the processes or events or symptomatology of a condition you're looking at. And then in real time, converting what's going on in terms of brain activity into a signal using computer technology. And that's usually either an auditory signal or a visual signal, such as a picture of a rocket ship flying, and then feeding that back, delivering it to the subject, and then asking or training the subject to alter what they're seeing on the screen or what they're hearing, and thereby changing their brain activity patterns. And then the final steps are to check that it's working is one to see if brain activity patterns are in fact changing in the way you expect. And then hopefully also checking to see that symptomatology of whatever condition you're looking at has changed. Now for decades, most of the, if not all the neurofeedback for ADHD and other studies was EEG based, so electroencephalogram. And one of my talks, I believe it's more than a year ago, got into the details of alpha waves and beta waves and aspects of the EEG. I'm not going to go into the details here. What I'll say is that EEG, an electroencephalogram measuring the electrical activity of the brain, one is we're averaging over thousands of neurons firing at the same time in order to register a big enough electrical signal. So we're not looking at the level of individual action potentials at all. EEG has very good temporal resolution. So one is we're measuring a direct sign of brain activity. You can measure from electrodes over different parts of the brain, but it's a pretty crude measure and in general is best at looking at what's going off the surface of the brain. More recently, some studies are using functional magnetic resolution imaging. So fMRI neurofeedback, in contrast, has pretty good spatial localization. So you can identify areas as small as a few cubic millimeters, although even that area is representing probably more than half a million neurons and nerve cells. A couple of problems with fMRI. One is that you're not measuring a direct action of neural activity you are indirectly measuring blood flow changes in certain and oxygenated blood flow to a certain small region of the brain and using that as a proxy measure to assess brain activity in that area. And because of that, the vascular response changes in blood flow as a result of neural activity have actually a lag time of a few seconds in the range of two to six seconds. So it's not quite as quick on the uptake. And another problem is that fMRI is fairly sensitive to small movements of the head. That's why you're in a big fMRI machine with your head padded so it doesn't move. But given that individuals with ADHD, particularly hyperactive type, move around much more, and particularly head movements are much more prevalent than with neurotypical adults, there can be lots of artifact or confusion in interpreting the signals you're reading because of head movements. Some estimates would say the very first EEG feedback experiments go back as far as 1935, so almost 90 years. But the first clear-cut study on something that looked like ADHD and EEG feedback was done in 1976, so close to 50 years now of 
some research in this area. And there's three different EEG protocols that have been favored or claimed to be particularly effective for ADHD. So one thing, even the proponents of neurofeedback for ADHD will point out that we don't have standardized protocols. So unlike a drug trial where if you're taking 15 milligrams of Ritalin, presumably that 15 milligrams is the exact same thing, whether you're studying it in Boston or Mumbai or Beijing, the number of doses is much easier to standardize what time of day you can standardize. So your intervention is narrower and easier to control with the EEG, even if you're staying using one of the standard protocols, for example, uh, data to beta ratio places, maybe placing the electrode slightly differently, may have slightly different parameters for collecting information from different bandwidths and for processing it. So there are three at least semi-standardized protocols that have been used for neurofeedback for ADHD, and those which include most prominently the TBR, which is the beta-beta ratio. So that's based on the claim that, so these are different frequency ranges in the EEG, that the TBR is higher among people with ADHD and that training people to reduce their TBR ratio then should correlate with improvement in ADHD symptoms. It's clearly not a diagnostic tool in and of itself. And the more this is looked at, one, the more the TBR seems to have been increasing in neurotypical kids over the last few years. And there's considerable debate even whether we can find consistent differences in TBR in people with ADHD at baseline or not. The other two fairly standardized protocols are called the sensory motor rhythm, SMR, so R here is for rhythm, not ratio, and that's measuring electrical activity over the sensory motor strip. It was found that teaching people with epilepsy, so recurrent seizures to control their activity, resulted in reductions in epilepsy and some claims also of studies showing reducing or training people with ADHD on an SMR protocol can result in improvement in ADHD symptoms. At least one study suggested that improvements in sleep, particularly reducing the latency to sleep, accounted for much of the improvement in the ADHD people treated with the protocol like that. And then there's a third standardized protocol called a slow cortical potential, which measures looking at shifts in overall neural activity and ways to control that so that you can either reduce or increase the overall excitability of your brain or your response to external stimuli controls. Even the defenders of neurofeedback point out any individual clinic can employ whatever protocol they desire. And even if they think they're doing the same protocol, it may differ from other people who have the same name or title for what they are doing. People who've analyzed the data would say, given that the approaches we have, none of them are particularly impressive. There would be a high desire or demand to do something a little different, tweak it a little differently, to measure a slightly different area. But again, if you're doing that, then it's hard to know or interpret whether you're really getting better results or not. One of the most frequently studied or quoted by defenders of neurofeedback is a 2020 meta-analysis by Arns and his colleagues. And they sort of prominently claim in their summary that the neurofeedback for EED had positive effect on reducing ADHD symptomatology. They particularly point out, and most of the reviewers or people who repeat this study point out that if you looked at six months after the end of the study, people on medications did not retain all the benefits six months out that they had at the end of the study. Whereas in this EEG meta-analysis, and they only looked at four studies, all four of the individual studies showed a slight increase over time, so in the six months from the end of the study. So the claim was benefits continued accruing. And they make much of this statement, but if you look at what they're actually, the actual data they show pictures of or graphs of, these either decrements up or down 
from the end of the study to the six month out follow up constitute less than 10% of the change. So these are statistically or measurably very tiny changes, further changes. And furthermore, if you look at it, even if they improved slightly from the end of their study to the six month follow up, the efficacy was only half of what they found in the medication group. Even the study, which is touted as one of the most powerful or the best of the best, showing the case for neurofeedback EEG or ADHD, the benefits are less than half of what you get from standard medication treatment and roughly comparable to a purely behavioral with no medication component intervention. So I would argue not terribly impressive. And furthermore, some of the problems with the neurofeedback EEG is that many studies have been done without a control group. Many studies have been done without being blinded to the treatment. And many studies on further replication don't look nearly as good as they do when you blind participants. So some of the studies that have employed a control group whether it's a sham treatment or training someone on a different area of their brain, which would be a different active group, suggests that both groups show improvement in ADHD symptoms. And the claims from the critics of neurofeedback is that all of the results would be explainable by improvements you get from forcing kids or adults to sit down and concentrate on a task and do that over time that there seem to be non-specific effects rather than anything specific at all, the neurofeedback training. The recent editorial in the American Journal of Psychiatry by James McGough, I don't know if he pronounces McGough or McGough or how he pronounces his name. He's a UCLA psychiatrist specializing in ADHD. And his Contention is that I'm looking around in this field for 40 years and we still have yet to show good results. Maybe it's time to stop more studies. And specifically, on neurofeedback is a general topic. So his response was commenting on a recent study very recently in the last month, published also in the American Journal of Psychiatry, looking at a fMRI neurofeedback protocol. And this was a group led by Lamb and others using functional magnetic resonance imaging, training kids to activate the inferior frontal cortex. So this is an area that has found pretty consistently to be relatively inactive or lower activity levels in kids and adults with ADHD, training them to activate this area of the brain and then looking for positive benefits for ADHD symptomatology. In their open original study, where people knew what treatment they were getting, did seem to be an improvement over time as people practiced activating their inferior frontal cortex. And there seemed to be a clear difference compared to the sham treatment group. But when they went back and redid the study with a substantially larger number of testers, parents, the subjects themselves were blinded into treatment. So the sham treatment was instead of getting feedback about what your own brain was doing, activity there was translated into a rocket ship going up or down on a screen and the picture they were being shown wasn't the result of what was going on in their own brain. It was a recording from a previous participant in the study. So there was no correlation with what the person was doing then now because it was not a picture of their own brain activity that they were getting. So that was considered an effective sham treatment. And in their study, using the sham versus the active neurofeedback, there were no differences at the end of the study or even during the study. Both groups improved in ADHD symptoms. There wasn't any greater improvement in the active group that was taught to increase their right inferior frontal cortex activity. When they checked the validity or the strength of the blinding, they actually found that the researchers could figure out which kids were getting which feedback, but neither the subjects themselves nor the parents were able to detect what was going on. So neurofeedback is widely touted as side effect free. So you don't have to worry about potential with addictions, cardiac effects, 
psychosis risk that are there with the stimulants and some of our other potential side effects. But the risk is pointed up in McGough's editorial is that if you are telling people to try this alternative approach, which may not work any better than just training a kid to sit there and concentrate for a while, maybe preventing them, particularly at a critical point in their life, from obtaining a treatment, which is one effective and I would argue there's some considerable evidence that can change the brain. And why I say that is there's more than three dozen studies looking at kids with ADHD. So comparing kids who are treated with stimulants for their ADHD versus kids with ADHD who received no stimulants. And in all except, I think, two or three of the studies by the end of late adolescence, early childhood, the kids who had received stimulant medications had brains that anatomically looked closer to the neurotypical than the kids who did not get stimulants. So there is a distinct possibility we may be depriving kids of an intervention that may actually, I don't want to use the word curative, but may more profoundly have long-term beneficial effects. What's hard to know is that there are so many different parameters. Maybe we're not just looking in the right regions for this. Maybe we're not training them a long enough period of time, have some other aspect of the protocol that could be tweaked or twisted. But particularly, there is a big both time and financial side effect of neurofeedback. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, people are charging 200 to $300 for a 30 to 40 minute session. Usually the claim, and I looked at several different websites, is that in 15 to 30 sessions, we can treat your ADHD, a few thousand to as much as $10,000 for a run of treatment. And the majority of patients I've worked with who've undergone such programs, one, we're always told, oh, at the end of the 15 or 30, you need more sessions because we're still not seeing the results we see with our other clients. Whether I'm seeing an unusual subset that was resistant or less responsive, or whether this is a marketing strategy, I don't know. One criticism frequently of the medication literature is that much of it is conducted by the drug companies who have a investment, but almost all, actually all the positive Neurofeedback studies I can find were conducted by people who have strong investments in neurofeedback clinics, and the neutral ones tended to be much more commonly led by academic researchers without such commitments. So reporter bias or experimenter bias is certainly possible. And what I would say is, this is roughly back of the envelope, but if you have your neurofeedback apparatus, if you're running at 50 weeks a year, 40 hours a week, maybe you can't fill it that much, but you could put in one and a half to two people an hour from a single setup. And most neurofeedback clinics have multiple setups. You're generating potentially half a million dollars a year. You think you could pile some of that back into research if you really felt confident that what you were doing was demonstrably helping kids with ADHD. And again, I'm not saying that kids aren't being helped, but whether they're being helped above and beyond just sitting in a chair, focusing on the rocket ship. We don't have convincing evidence that's doing beyond that. So that's what I will say for today. Stay healthy, stay happy, and have a good week. 